Good morning friends. This is Himanshu Srivastava. Today we have gathered here to discuss on the novels of Thomas Hardy. We have two experts today in the studio. Towards my right is Piyush Joshi. He is the coordinator of PG classes at HM Patel Institute, Villa Vidyanagar. And towards my left is Ulupi Patel. She is also a senior lecturer at uh, Sadguna Arts College. Uh, without wasting much of the time, I'll just ask sir to discuss about the background of Thomas Hardy and thereby we'll be focusing on the novels and different aspects of Thomas Hardy. Sir. Good morning, friends. <coughs> we are going to talk about Hardy and his novels today. But before we take up that discussion, it would be very important to talk about the Victorian age which happens to be a very long age in which intellectual fermentation continued for a very long time. In fact, the age was an age of contradiction, compromise or prosperity and number of other facets. However, <coughs> if we look into the age, we are, we are baffled at times by the variety that we come across. And I am interested in talking about how Hardy, uh, one of the major novelists of the time, tried to capture the sense of the time in his novels as well as poems. Hardy, if we remember him, uh, he wrote for almost six decades. He continued to write poetry, he continued to write novels, and the novels he wrote, but he was not very happy with his novels or fictions. He said that I am basically a poet, and he continued to write poetry for six decades, and the novels that he wrote continued to <coughs> be written between 1874 to 1895. It was probably in 1895 when he wrote the last novel, Jude the Obscure, and the literary critics were so unhappy with him, they were so hostile with him, that they criticized him so rigorously that he they stopped writing novels and he switched over to writing poetry. Today, in the modern times, people remember Hardy more as a poet than as a novelist. However, Hardy happens to be an interesting and very serious kind of a novelist and therefore we need to look into his problems, the problems that he projects about the time. The time when we talk about is a wonderful time. It was the reign of Queen Victoria who gave stability to the age. Stability brought prosperity. It was industrial revolution prosperity of the rich people. It talked about several things. But Hardy basically was interested in a small section of society which he was trying to project. And Hardy basically, if you compare him with the stalwarts of his own times, such as Dickens, Thackeray, George Eliot, Matthew Arnold, Tennyson, Browning, he stands out because he has his own way of looking at life, which is basically different from others. And personally, if you ask me, I would say, friends, Hardy is a difficult novelist to be read. He's a challenge because he has in-depth study of human character, in-depth study of nature, and he talks about various facets of life. But before we enter into that, it would be very interesting to know what kind of age he was in. As I said, it was an industrial age, prosperity was there, urbanization was taking place, people felt that it was a period of transition and crisis, and therefore Matthew Arnold wrote in 1869 a text called Culture and Anarchy. He was worried about the society that the society was moving in the direction of anarchy. And who could check this? 
and he advocated that good literature, good art should be there to check this. On the other hand, Browning remained a firm believer in God and the benevolent providence. He said that God is there in his heaven and therefore everything is right. On one hand we have people like Browning who had complete faith in this God and the Almighty, omnipresent, omniscient, omnipotent God. On the other hand, people were shaken or people's faith in God was shaken. It was just because Darwin's theory of origin genesis of and origin of species, of species came in. It was with this book he shook the foundations of Christianity. The authority of church was challenged now. And look at the book. The book is Origin of Species when he wrote. What was he doing? He just put forward a theory that man and ape have descended from the same ancestry. That means man is not created by God. Man is a product of evolution, natural process of evolution. And this man has not come all of a sudden on the scene. Now this was contradictory to the message given in the biblical myth or book of Genesis. There it was said that it was God who created things, it was God who created Adam and for the recreation of the world it was God who created even the woman. So Adam and Eve were the creations of God and the book of Genesis proved to be wrong and that's why people were baffled and people didn't know what to do and that's why Hardy as a man of science and technology or temperament, techni uh, scientific temperament also did not believe in the benevolent God. He had his own views. He felt that this God is ruled, this world is ruled by or this universe is ruled by an eminent will. Some power is there, some energy is there which rules this whole thing and this energy is not benevolent, it is rather malignant, it is indifferent, it is cruel and it comes, it doesn't care for the human beings and that's why he used this as eminent will and he describes this eminent will as, as a kind of fate and destiny. And when you look into this, in order to understand Hardy, the first thing that we need to understand is why did Hardy differ from the other writers? Other writers were talking, for example, Dickens talks about the social evils, especially out of industrialization. Eliot was talking about the problems of women, how women were suffering, how their emancipation should come up how their voting rights should be restored to them or they should be given the voting rights. All these issues were being discussed. Hardy is the man who is trying to project Wessex, an area which is in the southwest of England. Now this was the area where he was, he was brought up, he grew up, he knew the area very much, he was so familiar with the nature and the background, the topography that he projected that. So Wessex becomes an important thing. So Hardy is, whenever we talk about Hardy, Hardy is synonymous with Wessex. And Wessex is an area which is very well projected in his, almost all his novels. Secondly, which is very important for us to remember is, Hardy was looking at the issue of, as I said, malignant power, which doesn't care for death. And that's why he was not happy with those people who said that God is there, who looks after things. He on the contrary said this eminent will which is indifferent comes in the life of people in the form of faith or chance and disturbs them. It is so cruel at times that it crushes the man or man's spirit. That's why people say that Hardy is pessimist. But when we look at his novels and major characters, we find that these heroes and heroines fight there are a few instances where they uh, crush under the power of the fate or destiny, but there are people who fight out. And that's why when they fight out, their goodness comes to the surface and we realize that 
they are basically optimistic characters. So, it is wrong to say that he is a pessimist completely. He is an optimist and he presents his characters in a very beautiful manner. My intention in talking about this is, when you, understand, when you talk about the novels, you will have to understand his attitude of this. And out of this, two important words come here, which I think as students of literature you should understand. One is agnosticism and the second is atheism. The word agnosticism or agnostic means a person who does not believe, who does not believe in God or who feels that he wants to believe in God but he needs a proof. That means he believes in natural phenomena around him but he feels that if there is a, some supernatural power then he should be knowable and if he is not knowable then he would not like to believe. So agnostic is a person whom we can call skeptic, a man who doubts at the very existence of God. On the other hand you have a term called atheist, atheism. They are non-believers. So there is a slight line of demarcation between agnosticism and atheism. Agnostics believe that there is some power but then since it is unknowable, they would not be able to believe in that. Atheists, on the other hand, are not interested in that. So, these two terms, when you, when you enter into his novels, you realize that he is, his novels and his characters have this kind of a attitude, that they would not, they do not blame or they, they do not be, uh, trust the God or they have a non-traditional view of God or destiny. Secondly, the two more important terms that you need to understand are, one is realism and naturalism. Hardy is associated with naturalism. Let me tell you friends, what is the difference between realism and naturalism? Realism is a mode of presentation of reality, ab objects and things as they are, as they seem to be. It is unromantic presentation of reality or it is unglamorized presentation of reality. If you apply it to literature and art, then it becomes very clear that realism is trying to project life with all its seamy side or you can say all the ugly sides of life. When Dickens wrote the novels, he was talking about the ugly side of life and he said that he was interested in realism he would do that. But there is another term which is called as naturalism. If you look into the dictionary, they would say naturalism means it is more or less a kind of realism or it, there is a similarity between the two. However, there is a slight difference between the two. In realism, we are interested in what is being projected. In naturalism, we are interested in what is being projected over and above that, why is it so? So we go into causes and effects. For example, if a man behaves in irrationally, you want to know who is this man, why does he behave like that or what are the reasons behind that. So from realism when we move to naturalism, we are reminded of two persons. One is Emil Zola, a man who presented his novels in that way where he was talking about the element of heredity and environment. There is another man who is known as Taine, T-A-I-N-E. Taine was a man, a social philosopher, who talked about milieu, the race and the man. These two people came from different fields. There was the arrival of psychology and the arrival of sociology affected even literature and art and that's why when we talk about naturalism we have to say that naturalism would enter into the field of reality but also explore and probe into the reasons why people behave in that way. So there are two more terms come to our discussion that is heredity and environment. Heredity is something that you inherit from your parents, forefathers and all those things. So it's a psychological aspect. On the other hand, environment talks about, it is environment which shapes the psyche and consciousness of the man. 
So two forces are being put together in Hardy's novels. When we say realism, naturalism, then we have to look into heredity and environment and we are concerned with two more words which are called nature versus nurture. Nurture is how the child is brought up, again environment. And nature is basically the hereditary elements that he has. This, these two things are very important and in Hardy, very significantly, man is shown sometimes as a pawn, a tool, which is controlled by these forces. Either it could be heredity, it could be environment, or it could be the imminent will, which is very mysterious. And that's why man happens to be a poor instrument in the hands of these forces. If at all he tries to resist or protest that, then he, has, he is crushed or he has to sacrifice himself. So, all his novels, more or less, are basically tragedies. And one more thing that uh, Hardy per perhaps wanted to do during his lifetime was, he was in love with Wessex area and he was interested in the rustic life of these people. He loved those people, he loved the environment, he loved the customs and morality and everything, the conventions, and he wanted to capture them in his novels. And that's why uh, all through his novels, there is a movement from urban to rural. Other novels of the contemporary novelists, we feel people are under the spell of urbanization and they are moving from rural areas to urban areas. Here is people, though they have gone to urban areas, are trying to come back to the Wessex area and settle down. So this is a different kind of approach when he has. And lastly, when I talk about this, this kind of fascination for this, the idea behind his, in his mind was that he wanted to capture and preserve and conserve this Wessex area or Wessex people, the customs and traditions for a longer time in the form of history. Uh, before I switch over to another thing or before I ask my uh, fellow professor to talk about this, I would just quote a poem wherein he talks about how fate and destiny, the blind force, handles man. It's a beautiful poem uh, which talks about how human beings are treated by or, uh, uh, or projected here. It's a poem called At a Country Fair. It's a, it's a kind of a metaphor and when you look into the poem you would uh, find that he's talking about how destiny or fate controls the human beings. It calls the title of the poem is At a Country Fair and the poem runs like this. At a bygone western country fair, I saw a giant led by a dwarf. At a bygone western country fair, I saw a giant led by a dwarf with a red string like a long thin scarf. The giant seemed unaware. So the man is a giant but being ruled by a small dwarf and he is moving ahead in the guidance of that dwarf. And then I saw that the giant was blind. This is the problem. The giant, he is giant but he is blind. And then I saw that the giant was blind and the dwarf, a shrewd-eyed little thing, the giant, mild, timid, obeyed the string as if he had no independent mind or will of any kind. Whenever, wherever the dwarf decided to go, at his heels the other trotted meekly, perhaps I know not, reproaching weakly, like one fate bade that it must be so, whether he wished or no. Various sights in various climes I have seen, and more I may see yet, but that sight never shall I forget and have thought it the sorriest of pantomimes, if once a hundred times. So here he is trying to project his philosophy of life, the doctrine that he was being uh, fascinated by, and that was that how this is how fate controls human beings. And there is, a hum, there is, a co there is always a clash between the fate 
and the individual will and out of that there are tragic incidents and make the novels serious in tone and temperament. Uh, may I uh, yes. request uh, my colleague? Uh, we have uh, learned a lot uh, from Josie sir about how the temperament was, what the surrounding were. Now let us focus on the novels basically and I will request uh, Lupi Bin to concentrate on that. Ma'am. Uh, friends, uh, Joshi sir, he focused on uh, the dilemma of man between faith and technology, science. Uh, uh, Hardy's characters, they play, they are mere puppets between these two extremes of life. And finally, uh, as sir told that uh, uh, destiny is there, destiny, destiny plays uh, the major role in his novels and characters they are they are crushed and finally they they meet their end uh, so tragically that's why sir sir told that uh, his novels are uh, we can say these are tragedy look at the slide uh, friends hardy's novel uh, we can divide his novels into three different groups and three major groups are there uh, the first is uh, novels of character and environment, which are which are called Wessex novels, and the second is romances and fantasies, and the third is novels of ingenuity. In his novels of character and environment, uh, these novels are there. The first is Under the Greenwood Tree, Far from the Merry Crowd, The Return of the Native, The Mayor of Casterbridge, uh, The Woodlanders, and some more. Uh, novels are there and uh, Wessex tales, tales of the double village, life's little ironies and a few crusted characters and finally Jude the obscure. The second group consists a pair of blue eyes, the trumpet major, two on a tower, a group of noble dames, the well beloved and the third group uh, consists desperate remedies, the hand of Ethelberta, uh, Laodicean, uh, Hardy's Wessex novels. Uh, most of Hardy's Wessex novels uh, provide a rich source of nature imagery and we can see uh, country life in the center of the novel and we feel, we constantly feel a continuous relationship between natural beauties and man. Man is surrounded by natural beauties and he plays his role uh, in midst of these natural beauties. Uh, in Wessex novels we find one more thing and that's Hardy's deep affinities uh, with the farmland, rocks, hills and people who living among them. Here in the thin grasses, more, of, more or less coating the heel, were touched by the wind in breezes of differing powers and almost of differing natures, one rubbing the blades heavily, another wrecking them piercing, another brushing them like a soft broom. See, human being, uh, human, we human being, we, we characters, we have different mentality, we have different behavior, we have different attitudes towards uh, society, towards nature and here Hardy has projected this, one rubbing the blades heavily, another wrecking them piercing, another brushing them like a soft room. See here we can see the reflection of human mind, human behavior. Uh, friends, Hardy's use of accurate detail to individualize the different species of trees is typical to his natural realism. I think so you, you could uh, understand when Sir uh, told this, uh, Sir defined both of this word, one is naturalism and one is realism. Here we can see this perfect mixture of natural realism in Hardy's novels. Now look at the chief characteristics of Hardy's novels. Uh, Hardy's stage is chiefly set in rural Wessex. Uh, uh, his novels deal with Dorset farmers. Uh, uh, Hardy has sympathetic insight into farmers' life. And the dialogues uh, we find uh, sometimes unreal and the treatment of nature 
in his novels is poetic. Hardy frequently uses coincidence and accidents. Uh, we find a secret marriage, a pervading note of gloom, and a tragic and uh, sudden death of the central character. Let us see the themes of Hardy's novels. Uh, in, in the center of the novel, we find love affairs of principal characters and Hardy focuses on man proposes and God disposes. As Sir told, Joshi Sir told that uh, it's very difficult to understand Hardy's novels or Hardy. So his uh, plots are complex, but the plots are well knit. And these plots present the conflict between the old rural civilization and the new urban civilization. That was the worst e effect of uh, industrialization. We can say man was uh, in the dilemma between do these two, uh, two extremes of rural civilization, the rural morals and urban, civil urban civilization. Major of Hardy's characters were uh, Wessex peasants, laborers, shepherds, and singers. They were type rather than individual. They were not independent to uh, act like their own. Uh, the characters, most of the characters were emotional rather than intellectual. And that is why, sir, I think so, uh, we can say it's a tragedy. Yeah. Uh -huh. Emotional, they, they feel, they feel it. Uh, good people, good people were there. And they were noble, selfless, self-sacrificing, gentle-hearted. And of course, villains were there. And they were like dashing, sparkling, shifting, cunning, hypocritical, and fickle-minded. Hardy's male characters were vivid, passionate, emotional, and impulsive. While female characters, they consist subtlety, emotional uh, will, Passion, they were passionate and innocent. Now, uh, look at look at nature reflected in uh, Hardy's novels. We feel we feel a uh, uh, note of nature in Hardy's novels. Hardy shows nature as a sentient force with definite personality. He reflects this natural force. He reflects this uh, nature in any particular, any singular character of his novel. Next slide, please. Uh, Hardy's characters interact with nature. They talk to nature. They, they scream in, uh, in the midst of nature. They run. They feel that themselves relieved uh, in the midst of nature. So they interact with nature. They, they, talk, they talk about themselves to nature, to trees, to streams, to mountains, to hills to birds and even to the flowers of the wild uh, forest. Uh, uh, this, is, this is one point. Hardy's attitude towards nature was not Wordsworthian. Wordsworth worshipped nature. He, he loved nature. He worshipped nature. But Hardy's attitude towards nature was a little bit different. And uh, look at the next, uh, next slide, please. He did not believe that nature has any holy plan or healing power. Being influenced by the theory of evolution, he found much in nature that was cruel and antagonistic in, uh, to man. So nature here plays a, a role of antagonist. Uh, yes. The characters, they, they feel uh, themselves safe in the uh, midst of nature. But at the same time, the natural calamities here play the role of a cruel villain or an antagonist. Uh, several cap capacities of nature in Hardy's novel we will observe. Influence of nature on humanity. Influence of nature on the moods and actions of human characters. Uh, emotional connection between nature and human beings. And finally, the change in the atmosphere with a change of mood of the character. Here we can see this change, 
the mood of tess is well reflected when her virginity was ravished by alec i uh, see see the this description darkness and silence ruled everywhere around above them rose the primeval yews and oaks of the chase above them stole the hoping rabbits and hares but might some way where was tess's guardian angel where was the providence of her simple faith the question for religion the question for faith the question for the existence of the god is there if god is there if the god is omnipresent if the god is omnipotent where is he when uh, virginity of tess was ravished uh, look at this slide uh, far from the muddy cloud uh, which is one of the notable novels of uh, thomas hardy uh here in this novel we see the contrast of simple country life and madding crowd the ignoble strife of cities central love story uh of gabriel oak and bathsheba everden is there uh as uh, i can say uh, very innocent very innocent heroine bathsheba but her innocence is uh, what we can say it's uh, disguised she is a she is a capricious woman she is a capricious young lady and she is attracted by towards sergeant troy and she marries troy for his external polish and cultured manners uh troy troy uh, he is a villain uh, he is we can say uh, is not of uh, not from the list of good characters Troy before his marriage ruined an innocent farm girl and uh, whose name is Fanny and she meets a pathetic end by the end of this novel uh, this man sergeant troy proves himself an irresponsible and unloyal husband and oak saves bathsheba's farm during natural calamity while troy was drunken he invited his friends he invited the farmers to have drink on that particular farm on uh, on the on the day of uh, Uh, particular auspicious uh, festival and he was drunken and oak saves at the, that particular time bathsheba's farm during that natural calamity a uh, hardest sharp observation of nature is reflected in this scene see the night had a sinister aspect the moon as seen through this films had a lurid and metallic look the fields were sallow with impure lights the same evening the ship trail homeward head to tail the behavior of the rooks had been confused friends let me tell you here something that we we suffered a lot during the earthquake of 2001 at that particular time some some animals they show the symptoms they they show uh, this signs of this earthquake but we we were not able to decode their language and here see the sinister evening the sinister night was there and here the birds uh, the animals they behave in such a way that they show they show some signals they show some signs they show some symbols of forthcoming event or forthcoming uh, natural calamities here uh, the same the same evening the ship trail homeward head to tail and the behavior of the rooks rooks they it's a it's a uh, kind of crow rooks had been confused the horses had moved with timidity and caution thunder was imminent the thunder was coming and oak was enough sensitive to get the signals and that's why he refused to sergeant troy to have drink with the farmers and laborers and with troy and he he was an angel to save bachiba's farm at that particular evening uh his next novel tess of the the bubbles this novel is divided into seven phases through which tess passes the maiden maiden no more the rally the consequence the woman pays the convert the fulfillment these are the phases through uh the uh, tess passes next slide please uh tess here is described as a pure country girl pure country girl in hardy's words we can say see her personality for all her bouncing womanliness you could sometimes see her 12th year in her cheeks 
or her ninth sparkling from her eyes and even her fifth would filth over the curves of her mouth now she was a pure country girl quite innocent Tess Derby Phil is a poor country farm girl seduced by this is this we can say we can say in a very short lines we can say this uh, story about the novel Tess Derby Phil is a poor country farm girl seduced by the wealthy Alec de Beauvillet becomes pregnant uh, and the child dies in infancy uh, then Tess falls in love with Angel Claire who marries her when Angel Claire comes to know about Uh, Tess's past. He deserts her when uh, uh, when Tess was uh, in very happy mood, or she was feeling safe in hands of Angel. He deserts her and goes to Brazil. Once again, Tess becomes Alex's mistress. Uh, Angel returns from Brazil when he when he comes to know about the purity of this. woman she comes to uh, she she returns from the uh, from brazil and repents his harshness and finds tess living with alec tess kills alec in desperation arrested and hanged finally uh, as we as we told that uh, uh, the death sudden death of the central character and here nature reflected in this novel and the description of the september evening when tess goes to meet fellow workers just before sunset when yellow lights struggle with blue shades in hair like lines the innumerable wing insects dancing at next slide please uh through this floating frosty debris of peat and hay uh, it's a, it's a uh, stinging atmosphere mixed with the perspiration and warmth of the dancers and forming together a sort of vegeto human pollen then that ecstasy the dream began in which emotion was the matter of universe and matter but an adventurous intrusion likely to hinder you from spinning where you wanted to spin and here spinning is cosmic dance of the dancers uh this dance is cosmic two step dance and they are small spinning worlds themselves the farmers the laborers next slide please nature reflected in the novel had is use of birds imagery as symbol here we can say tess breaks the neck of wounded and dying pheasant she kills the birds tenderly why for what reason tess after separating from angel feels herself suffering evening sun was now ugly like a great in flame wound, wound in the sky only solitary cracked voiced reed sparrow greeted her from the bushes by the river in a sad machine made tone resembling that of a past friend whose friendship she had outworn here she remembers claire angel claire she feels injustice punishment exaction and death social law grinds down human spirit that's what test uh, spirit was grind down and relativity of sorrow with nature is there uh some criticism on hardy a rural back backdrop is neither romantic nor idealized overly pessimistic about humanity's place in the scheme of things and as Do- david cecil said Uh, in all his fiction chance is incarnation of the bind forces controlling human destiny next slide please hardy rested in peace on 11th of january 1928 this was an overall discussion uh, on hardy uh, sir has already uh, created a background about naturalism realism and all and madam capitalized over that point and discussed several novels and thereby uh, discussed uh, about the chief characteristics characters and thematic concerns atmosphere vesex and all uh, i'll just like sir to conclude uh, within one or two minutes sir uh, i'm very happy that she elaborated some of the novels the one salient feature that comes out before us is that hardy is talking about the vicissitudes of life the ups and downs the people suffer from hardy is interested in presenting human relationships especially the temperament fickle temperament 
and the incompatibility of marriage. There are people who are mismatches in marriage. The marriages are not stable. And then the relationships break down and then the people become unhappy. But the most important thing in Hardy is that when we read his poems or novels, the chance element, the destiny is playing a vital role which we cannot ignore. In one of his poems, he talks about two soldiers who are sitting together. They meet once and then they join the armies of enemies, opposites. And one of them kills the other. And when he has killed the other, he feels that he has done a bad job. And then he gives a information about that boy's past, whom he has killed. He says, he was unemployed, therefore he joined the army. It was fate or chance that put them in opposite camps. Otherwise, they could have sat together and joined a drink and talked merrily. But this was not to happen because chance or destiny plays an important role. And that's why Hardy, as a novelist or as a poet, is talking about something that is very enigmatic and mysterious in life. Uh, friends, I hope uh, you have enjoyed the talk more next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.